namaste to everybody i am going to address the question of the theory of uh, quantum gravity quantum gravity happens to be one of the most challenging questions that is facing our physics today our universe was born something like 13.7 billion years ago and all the fundamental laws of nature were also born right at that moment and we are trying to understand them for all this time so <coughs> uh, there are two fundamental theories at our hand one of them is quantum theory and one of them is general relativity and both of these theories they are the most accurate theories of nature even though the scales are very vastly different quantum theory holds at very small distances and general relativity holds at very large distances so in special relativity we have the equivalence of mass and energy and in quantum mechanics we have the possibility of creating energy out of vacuum which is not empty but it is a boiling soup of elementary particles being created and destroyed and this beautiful uh, uh, property of quantum mechanics makes it possible for us to marry special relativity with quantum mechanics as a result what we get is a beautiful theory called quantum field theory which is summarized into the so called standard model of particle physics uh, very accurate theory of nature most of its predictions have been tested already and its particle contents is six quarks six leptons vector gauge bosons that mediate the fundamental forces of nature and the unique higgs scalar uh, the very famous god particle called by the media so <coughs> now about general relativity this is a theory that explains the physics of the universe quantum theory explains the physics the large micro cosmos large of micro cosmos and universe inside the atom and general relativity explains this entire universe physics of the solar system black holes wormholes time travel and what not so and this theory Uh, general relativity is a unique theory that got experimentally verified seven decades prior to its birth so the theory was born in 1915 at the hands of albert einstein and david hilbert and in 1845 70 years ago there was a french astronomer le verrier who measured the advance of perihelion of mercury in its motion in its revolution around the sun and the measurements made by le verrier they tally exactly it's a very tiny object but it's very extremely well measured and it agrees perfectly well with the predictions of general relativity so <coughs> this is a very unique theory in this particular sense apart from this there are several other experimental tests like gravitational waves everybody hears about them they make the headlines on the newspapers so gravitational wave detection at the ligo detector construction of the image of a black hole sitting at the center of a distant galaxy uh, called m87 and we also have a supermassive black hole sitting at the center of our own galaxy the milky way galaxy and its location is called as sagittarius a star there are several objects that revolve around this uh, sagittarius a star location this supermassive black hole one of them is star s2 and the period of revolution of this s2 around this uh, location is 16 point something years and this recent nobel laureate in physics uh, the woman physicist andrea gage she measured the track the orbit of this guy star s2 for 16 years and she measured very accurately the advance of perihelion of this s2 around this sagittarius a star and the two this experimental observation and the theoretical prediction by general relativity they match extremely well so 
it's an extremely, this is the super test of general relativity and the most recent one. Now, you might wonder if general relativity is so successful, why should you look for so-called quantum gravity? Well, we have special, we have still lots of places where general relativity breaks down. There is a question of singularity. Black holes are the well-known space-time singularities of nature. And Big Bang, if you run the universe backwards in time for 13.7 billion years, it be hit upon a singularity called as the Big Bang when everything came into existence. Now, general relativity explains everything perfectly well except for the last small gap where we reach Planckian energies, Planckian time, Planckian mass, 10 to the power minus 43 seconds time. So you, after that, your general relativity no longer works and you need something further. You see, after all, all of us, we want to know about our origin. So origin of the universe and your general relativity breaks down at that point and you need a theory of quantum gravity. Well, also black hole, let me just tell you that if I squeeze my earth, I keep its mass fixed and I reduce its radius and then the earth becomes a spherical ball of 8.43 millimeters, my earth would become a black hole. Why? At this very point, the escape velocity of earth becomes identically equal to the velocity of light. So if I throw a photon from the surface of Earth, it will fall back. So that is the black hole, nothing can escape. And you talk about the event horizon, an imaginary unidirectional surface around the black hole, which nobody can escape. Things can enter into it, but cannot come out. So, Moreover, if you calculate, for example, the potential energy due to some mass m, then you find that heavier the mass, deeper the singularity. So singularity can be so deep, depending upon its earth or mass, or earth or moon or sun, or a black hole or a supermassive black hole, this uh, singularity bell goes deeper and deeper, and the space-time curvature becomes so small, 10 to the power minus 33 centimeters of this order of magnitude, then general relativity breaks down. In general, it's a generic problem. What happens? A particle of mass m, when it approaches its, its size or the Compton wavelength to be of the order of the Schwarzschild radius, as I so told you just now, 8.43 millimeter for our Earth. So then, <coughs> uh, then the usual theories would no longer work and you will need a theory of quantum gravity to explain it further. Fine, then that makes us ready to think about how do we go about a theory of quantum gravity if it's so crucial. Well, I said a standard model based on quantum field theory is a perfectly well-defined uh, theory tested experimentally to several digits at experiments like Large Hadron Collider and several other accelerators around the world. And I mean, these are the experiments, the most expensive experiments available on Earth. And so, but this theory has local symmetry, but it does not have gravity into it. That is the point. It unifies other three fundamental forces, but not gravity. So I would like to introduce gravity and then quantize the theory to see how can I construct the theory of quantum gravity. Now, what I do is I introduce supersymmetry into my standard model. What is supersymmetry? A supersymmetry rotates bosons into fermions and fermions into bosons. So <coughs> that there is a super partner for each and every particle in the standard model, like electron would have a supersymmetric electron, quark would have a supersymmetric quark, etc. It's a photon would have some photon or something. So some super partner, okay? So boson for a fermion, fermion for a boson, okay? Now, 
this is a beautiful theory that I have obtained. This is supersymmetric standard model. Its particle content is double that of the standard model. And its divergences in this theory have got reduced considerably, but not yet gone completely. Now, this supersymmetric standard model has a rigid supersymmetry or a global supersymmetry, so I have to make it a local supersymmetry. I have to construct a gas theory of gravity, and that turns out to be uh, known by the name supergravity theory. So supergravity theory turns out to be a gas theory of gravity. So what do I do? I make the metric of my theory dynamical. I introduce a super gas field like a photon in the electrodynamics. I introduce a super gas field. This is a spin 3 half particle which is available only and only within super gravity theory. A spin 3 half field given by a spinner vector or a vector spinner uh, object. And this is done through a super covariant derivative. Then it has to be made dynamical so that it can move around, can interact. So I introduce a kinetic energy term for this. Now my graviton also needs to be made dynamical. What do I do? I source its kinetic energy through the so-called Hilbert-Einstein action in my theory. And then I am ready with my super gravity theory. I can introduce as many supersymmetries as I wish in my theory. So n equal to 1, 2, 4, n equal to 8 supersymmetry. What happens in this n equal to 1 supergravity? I have a super multiplet of 1 spin 2 photon and 1 spin 3 of gravity. No. If I have n equal to 2, I have 1 graviton with spin 2, 2 gravitinos with spin 3 of and a photon like object. Mr. Einstein, had he been present today, would have been extremely happy. This was the dream theory of Mr. Einstein because it unifies gravitational interaction with the electromagnetic interaction. Now, if I calculate photon-photon going to photon-photon, photon-photon scattering, in n equal to 1 theory and in n equal to 2 theory, what I find, the results in n equal to 1 theory are still divergent, but results in n equal to 2, th two theories are perfectly finite. So, supergravity theory is finite order by order in perturbation theory, and because it's finite, it has predictive power. So I can calculate several processes in supergravity theory, and they are uh, perfectly well calculable. However, the signals, experimental signals, are too weak to be detected experimentally. So we need a smart uh, younger generation that can think of some alternative experimentation. And <coughs> now, if I go to n equal to 8 supergravity, what I find here, I have one n equal to 8 supergravity theory is a kind of a complete theory of quantum gravity of zero dimensional particles and fields. Here I have one graviton with spin plus 2, one graviton with spin minus 2, 8 gravity nodes with spin 3 half plus 8 with spin minus 3 half, 28. Uh, photon-like vector particles with spin plus 1, 28 with spin minus 1, 46, 56 spin 1 half, electron-like objects, okay, uh, with spin plus 1 half and 56 with spin minus 1 half, and 70 Higgs-like scalars, the God particle. Now, instead of 1, you have 70. So it's a very, very rich theory, and divergences, to my best guess, would disappear perfectly, completely from the theory. But I would still not call it the ultimate theory of quantum gravity. I would go one step further. So what I will do, I would now consider extended objects called strings that could be open with two ends open or closed with some loops. Now when a point particle moves in the space-time manifold, it sweeps out a trajectory called as the bird line. If a one-dimensional object moves around, it will sweep a seat, which could be a seat or it could be a tube, cylindrical tube, for example. Now the strings, they uh, interact via splitting and joining. And therefore, what happens that the interaction vertices where three lines meet, they become spreaded in space-time. And therefore, this theory is super renormalizable, have no 
infinity is whatsoever, it's a perfectly finite theory, super renormalizable, and it has gravity in it by construction. And on the moreover, when I obtain the mass spectrum of string theory, I am going to obtain precisely what I had in my supergravity theory. So the strings can, can move around, they have tension, they can vibrate, their vibrational modes could be characterized by some quantum numbers, spin mass, etc., etc., and each vibrational mode could be identified with some fundamental particle. Now, if I calculate the mass spectrum of the open string theory, ground state is tachyonic, which means with imaginary mass where particle can move faster than light, so it's unphysical, so we ignore it. The same thing happens also with the ground state of the closed string theory. However, the first excited state of an open string theory is a photon-like object. First excited state of a closed string is a graviton-like object. So you start getting the things. Now, if I consider a supersymmetric uh, super string theory and I obtain the mass spectrum, the mass spectrum in the Raymond sector is uh, space-time fermions like electrons or quarks and the mass spectrum of the nebula sector is uh, consists of bosons, space-time bosons like a photon or some such objects. So you see the mass spectrum of the superstring theory agrees perfectly well with the supergravity theory and apart from that there would be some massive states but they would be in the mass range of Planckian mass, so 10 to the power 19 GeV, they will not be visible at the moment. So, also the solutions of the equations of motion, they tally or agree with four large flat dimensions and six curled up dimensions. Superstring theory is defined in d equal to 10 dimensions and bosonic string theory in d equal to 26 dimensions. No problem at all, the extra dimensions can be curled up into a tiny space of the order of 10 to the power minus 33 centimeters and they would not be observable to us. So, uh, but we obtain the superstring theory could be the ultimate theory of quantum gravity or could be the ultimate candidate theory of quantum gravity to be more, audace, to be more modest and with its mass spectrum agreeing with the mass spectrum that we obtained in super, super gravity theory. So super gravity theory is the low energy limit of the super string theory and it's the intermediate step between super string theory and the observable physics. So I think with, with that uh, I might gradually conclude with the hope that we are somewhere around the corner in obtaining for a candidate theory of quantum gravity. I would still not call the final theory, but let it be a candidate theory of quantum gravity. I hope uh, we, we survive with that, and I wish you all the best. I conclude my talk. Thanks very much.